You might have heard the rumors going around that hot dogs are chock full of all the grossest leftover bits of meat that are ground up and squeezed inside of a casing. But is that actually true? What's really inside of a hot dog? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. In 1906, Upton Sinclair published a book called The Jungle, which exposed mountains of misbehavior within the meat industry. Harsh working conditions, exploited employees, and extremely unsanitary food. The book set off a firestorm around the country as people learned just how filthy and disease-ridden the meat industry was at the time. And yes, even our beloved hot dogs. Hot dogs and other meat products were filled with sawdust, dead rats, horse and dog meat, and all sorts of other unspeakable things that left people shocked. Public outcry led the U.S. government to pass a law that made it illegal to mislabel meat products, that made sure meat was slaughtered and processed under strict guidelines that would keep all the food significantly safer and more sanitary. And the same went for hot dogs. The meat packers could no longer squeeze whatever leftovers they want into a casing and call them beef or pork hot dogs. Now they had to clearly label the ingredients like everything else. You might be tempted to think that because hot dog ingredients are clearly listed that they might not be so bad for you, but sadly, it's not so simple. The thing is, you might have to do a little more digging to really understand what's written on the label of a modern day hot dog to know what you're actually eating. A hot dog you'd buy from the supermarket is usually made of beef or pork, or sometimes turkey or chicken. And while those dogs are definitely made of those meats, it's important to note they're technically made of trimmings. What are trimmings, you ask? Well, it's a nice way to say all the discarded things left over after cutting up meat, like fat, tissue, organ bits, and skin to name a few. From there, the pile of stuff is cooked, ground into a paste, and mixed with other additives and spices to make it taste good. Finally, the meat paste is pumped into casings and cut into that classic shape, cooked one more time, then packaged for stores. This might sound kind of gross, and honestly, it kind of is. But it's important to point out that it's all above board, edible, and USDA approved. And if you love hot dogs, but all that pink paste makes you a little queasy, just look for all natural dogs. Any product labeled as all pork or all beef is gonna be the kind of muscle meat you're likely much more used to eating in steaks or other meals. And now that you know how the hot dogs are made, let's pull out the condiments. Because it's time to eat, if you dare. There's few foods as American as the classic hot dog. But have you ever wondered what exactly a hot dog is? Does it qualify as a sandwich? Or is it something else entirely? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. Let's start with a brief history of the hot dog. The hot dog we know and love today was originally popularized by a Polish immigrant to the U.S. named Nathan Handwerker. He opened a hot dog stand on Coney Island in New York City, charging just five cents per dog. His grilled hot dogs were a smash hit. Before long, Nathan's famous hot dogs were known across the country. They were so popular, in fact, that Eleanor Roosevelt served grilled hot dogs at a picnic for King George VI of England and his queen. Okay, so that's how hot dogs became a classic all-American food, but that doesn't actually answer the question. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Well, it all depends on who you ask. According to the National Hot Dog and Sausage Council, which is a real thing, hot dogs are not a sandwich. Then what is it, you might ask? According to the council, a hot dog is an exclamation of joy, a food, a verb that describes showing off, and even an emoji. It is truly a category unto its own. Well, if that answer doesn't satisfy you, then good. 
It's an unsatisfying answer. But luckily, there are other authorities out there willing to take a stronger stance. Merriam-Webster Dictionary said, in no uncertain terms, that a hot dog is a sandwich. Here's why. Since the actual definition of a sandwich is two or more slices of bread or a split roll having a filling in between, a hot dog absolutely qualifies. So, I guess that settles it once and for all. A hot dog is, in fact, a sandwich. Well, congratulations, everyone. We did it. And now you know that hot dogs are sandwiches. Nowadays, cities and towns all across the globe seem to have fast food restaurants on every corner. But why? Who actually invented fast food in the first place? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. Like many of the greatest inventions, no one person invented fast food by themselves. The very earliest versions of fast food could be found all around the ancient world. Most average Romans lived in apartment buildings without full-fledged kitchens and would mostly rely on vendors and ready-made meals. Almost a thousand years ago, people in China would buy snacks from vendors like fried dough, soup, or stuffed buns, all of which are eaten to this day. During the Middle Ages, regular people living in big cities like London and Paris mostly ate food they bought from vendors or storefronts. Pies, waffles, pastries, cookies, pancakes, and cooked meats. But the modern fast food industry we see today really began in the United Kingdom in the mid-1800s. That's when the British favorite fish and chips was invented. You see, fish and chips were a convenient, cheap, easy-to-make snack that became an everyday meal among the working class of England. By 1920, there were over 35,000 fish and chip shops across the UK. And in 1928, the very first fish and chip fast food chain restaurant opened its doors. Around the same time in the United States, the burger joint White Castle was founded in Wichita, Kansas. It's generally considered the second fast food chain and the first hamburger chain. White Castle was super successful from day one and led to a ton of competitors. You've probably heard of some of those competitors because the fast food industry took off from there, spawning dozens of hyper-successful fast food chains that operate in more than 100 countries across the world. So that's how fast food was invented. Now, whether or not it's healthy for you, that's a whole other question entirely. And now you know where fast food restaurants came from. It's cold, bubbly, crisp, and we drink a ton of it. So who actually invented soda pop in the first place? Let's find out on today's episode of Colossal Question. To find out who first invented soda, we need to flash back to England in the year 1767, where a scientist named Joseph Priestley first discovered a method for creating carbonated water. He loved the taste of his new bubbly drink and at first just shared it with family and friends who came to visit. But in 1772, Priestley published a paper called Impregnating Water with Fixed Air, where he laid out his process for the masses. One of the people who read his paper was John Mervyn North, who improved on Priestley's design and sold it commercially to pharmacies. Why pharmacies instead of convenience stores? Well, in those days, mineral water was considered a health drink, kind of like the smoothies of their day. Eventually, pharmacies started adding different herbs and chemicals to improve the flavor. Ginger, birch bark, dandelion, sarsaparilla, fruit extracts, and all sorts of other things. People loved these new fizzy drinks, and soda quickly grew in popularity. But there was one huge problem that was keeping soda from being mass-produced they didn't have a good way to seal the glass bottles shut. Inventors tried for years to devise ways to trap the carbonation inside without letting the gas leak and not pressurizing bottles too much that they exploded. It took them years and dozens of different designs, but eventually the crown cork bottle seal was invented by a machine shop owner in Baltimore. This was the first cap to successfully trap the bubbles inside, and we still use it today. Now with a spiffy new cap, sales of bottled soda took off. 
vending machines were invented in the 1920s, and the soda can came along in the 30s, which gave customers even more ways to find it. So, who invented soda? Well, no one person invented that fizzy drink alone, but Joseph Priestley and his bubbles got the party started, so thanks for that! And now you know where soda came from! One of the most common foods we eat as kids today are chicken nuggets! Whether it's out of the oven at home or from the drive-thru at the fast food place down the street, we just can't seem to get enough of them! But who actually invented chicken nuggets? Let's find out on today's episode of... Colossal Question! Just like many of our favorite modern foods, the origin of the chicken nugget is a bit murky, and no one can say for absolute certain who invented them. That being said, a scientist and professor named Robert C. Baker is most often credited with inventing chicken nuggets in his lab at Cornell University in the early 60s. Whether he was the true innovator of the nugget or not, Robert C. Baker was clearly passionate about bird meat. He came up with more than 40 new ways to prepare poultry, with inventions like chicken hot dogs, ground chicken, and whatever turkey ham is. Okay, so that's who likely invented the fast food staple, but why was Baker trying to create a new concoction, and how did he do it? The nugget was invented to solve a big problem for the slumping chicken industry. At the time, almost all chickens were sold whole, which kind of made it inconvenient. A whole chicken wasn't thought to be quite enough meat to feed an entire family, but it was definitely too much for just one person. On top of that, roasting a whole chicken takes a lot of time and effort, and families were finding they had less and less time to dedicate to making more complicated meals. Now, with these newfangled chicken nuggets, there was finally a way to package poultry in easy, bite-sized servings that could be frozen and fried up quickly. Problem solved! Baker's big innovation that made the chicken nugget possible was because of another one of his poultry creations, ground chicken. He molded chunks of skinless, ground-up chicken meat and covered them with breading. The breading is actually the key. It holds the morsels of meat together while sitting in a freezer or frying in a pan. And almost overnight, chicken went from a food not quite fit for a feast to one of the most popular proteins in the country all by turning chicken into a handheld, well, nugget. So, next time you're plowing through a pile of dino-shaped nuggets, you can thank a poultry pioneer for making it his passion project to bring us the perfect chicken snack and nailing it. Junk food. Oh, it can be so delicious. Maybe even too delicious. Today, we're gonna try and answer this once and for all. Is fast food bad for you? Let's find out on today's episode of... Colossal Question. We've all been there. You grab a bag of your favorite snack and you start chomping them down. You chomp and you chomp and you chomp again and suddenly, what? The bag is empty? What gives? As it turns out, junk food can be so completely addictive because, well, it was designed that way. That's right, food companies use some pretty sophisticated science-based techniques to keep us chowing down. All junk foods are trying to hit what they call the bliss point, or a perfect flavor that isn't too much or too little and keeps you always wanting more. The main way that companies manage to keep that flavorful bliss point is by adding one specific ingredient, sugar. And they add it to all sorts of foods you might not expect. White bread, salad dressing, ketchup, barbecue sauce, orange juice, granola bars, and spaghetti sauce, just to name a few. Every year, people become more and more aware how bad ingredients like sugar, salt, and fat can be when you have too much of it. As a result, junk food companies have tried to use less of the bad ingredients people are looking out for and replace them with other bad but not quite as bad options to make up for the taste. That lets junk food companies sell their snacks as low sugar or low sodium, making people think that they might be choosing a healthier option. So is junk food actually bad for you? Well, if you're eating lots of it every day, yes it is. And remember, if a delicious salty or sugary snack sells itself as low salt or low sugar, that doesn't mean it's healthy. And now you know that junk food really is bad for you, no matter how good it tastes. 